Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, this is a, an early Gimel Thomas event because I'm not available Gimel Thomas. So it, it coincides. It happens to be the 81st anniversary of the Rebbe's arriving in New York. The Rebbe came in 1941 on this date, Chav Sivan, the 28th day in the month of Sivan, and it was actually also a Monday. The Rebbe arrived on a Monday. And I just remember that I remember this happening that... Um, in the Hayoim Yoim, it said, Sivan Tov Shenalaf Magil in New York. The Rebbe arrived in New York in Sivan. It didn't say the day, it said the, the month. And it, was, it would have been very easy to figure out, but nobody bothered figuring it out. So no one knew when the Rebbe arrived in New York, so we couldn't make a Yom Tov because we, we couldn't pin down the date. Until the previous Rebbe's letters were published. People of Igris Kodesh. I was a Bachar at the time. This is about close to 40 years ago. When the Rebbe's letters were published, the previous Rebbe's published, I was a Bacher, so every night I would go to bed and read letters, and then the book would hit me in the face and wake me up, and then I'd read some more and hit me in the face until I'd fall asleep. Um, but there's a letter which is dated today, Monday, Chav Chassiv, 1941, written to a rabbi from Boston, whose name was Abdov Meir Abinovich, that Adam, a very, very prominent rabbi, a very big goan, an old Lubavitch Chassid, he'd been a Chassid yet from the Rebbe Marash, and the Rebbe writes to him that today, <coughs> my daughter, and he says her name, and my son-in-law, the Gon, and the Rebbe's name, Baruch Hashem arrived safely to New York, and I'm hastening to tell you, I want you to know right away. And then the Rebbe says, please tell your son, Mr. Usher, Mar Usher, that, uh, that they came. So we knew the date, the Rebbe arrived on the Monday, Chav uh, Ches, 1941. So, as soon as we know the date, so we had another holiday, right? Like, Lubavitch is unlike Jews, you can give him a reason. <laughs> it's like another three holidays. So, so when the, the volume of Igres Kodesh, these letters were published, and we knew the date, so um, Rabbi Harley got up, the line gesund and start, got up and said, in 70, you know, all the young people have got, no, I don't know if you haven't noticed, <laughs> at least on the men's side, on about the women's section. <laughs> All the young people have gotten old. Even I'm uh, not young anymore. I'm still young, but uh, my beard doesn't uh, tell that tale. Um, but the mayor of Zangizunt, he was, he's been around 770 his whole life. He got up and he announced that they're making a special fabringen on the occasion of the Rebbe's arrival in New York. And I remember the Rebbe's response. It was in the middle of the fabringen. It was a normal thing that at some point during the fabringen, the Rebbe would say he's going to give everybody mashke who's making a special event that should come up and they should announce what the event is about, and the Rebbe is going to give them some mashke. And the Rebbe always said, give some of it out here, because otherwise it's called Mechem and Shabbos L'choyl, would not be allowed. You can't prepare on Shabbos for the weekdays, and then the rest you'll save for whatever occasion it is. So Rabbi Harlik, like all the others, got up, and he announced that this week, on this and this date, which is the date that the Rebbe arrived in New York, the Chassidim are going to make a fabrengen, and he's inviting everybody. So the Rebbe would sit when these announcements were being made, he would look in the Chumash, he would look around, he would sometimes look at the speaker, and when Rabbi Harlick said that the Rebbe arrived in New York, the Rebbe said loud, but in a very, very good-natured way, very, very happy tone. Ishu Beisoy. I didn't come alone. I came with my wife. The Rebbe wanted him to say Ishu Beisoy. So that's uh, the story. Now, who is Mr. Uh, Asker Rabinovich? The Rebbe wrote a letter to Rabbi David Meir Rabinovich and said, please tell your son that my son-in-law has arrived. He was a, he was, his father was a big rov and a big chassid and a big gon. He was a modern man. He was an Orthodox Jew. He was a from man. But you're talking 80 years ago. It's very hard to understand what Yiddishkeit looked like in America 80 years ago. If you were a Shemesh Shabbat, you were a big tzaddik. Not a tzaddik. A big tzaddik. So Mr. Uh, Rabinowitz, whose father was this very great rabbi, was a lawyer. He, he's from Boston originally, but he was living in Washington. And he saved the Rebbe's life. He was the attorney who negotiated with the State Department to allow the Rebbe to come in. There was a big question, I don't know the details offhand, but whether they should bring the Rebbe in on the quota or off the quota. And I think they changed their mind at some point. If he's coming as a rabbi, he should come off the quota. If he's coming as an engineer, he should come on the quota. And I think the wires got crossed and it got a little tricky because is he an engineer or is he a rabbi? So how is he coming? <laughs> is he an we need engineers, we don't need rabbis, right? But um, so this Mr. Rabinowitz was instrumental in getting the Rebbe to America. Um, 31 years ago in 1991, which was the 50th anniversary of that occasion, 
they published a pamphlet to celebrate the occasion, the event, and with some of the historical details. The Rebbe was living in Paris, and the Rebbe ran away from the Nazis right before Schwarz, a whole year earlier, 1940. He arrived after Schwarz in 1941. And he moved to the south of France. The Nazis only occupied northern France. Southern France, they had what they called the Vichy government, and then there was Italian France. Um, and, and Jews felt a little safer. I mean, I don't know if it was safe the whole war. I don't know if it was safe. In fact, the Jews felt a little safer, so they ran away from Nazi-occupied France. And um, the Rebbe came to either, either Marseille or Nice. I think it was Marseille. And he went into the embassy or the consulate, the United States embassy, and he said, listen, I got, I have um, visas to come to the United States. And the ambassador or the counselor was playing games with him. It turned out that he was pushing an anti-Semite. And he was not going to let the Rebbe come to America, even though the Rebbe had a visa. So this Rabinowitz on the American side figured this out. And the Rebbe was cabled to move to a different city. So he moved. I think from Marseille to Nice. Could be from Nice to Marseille. You could look it up. The, the, uh, you don't care so much about the details, right? You're not like my students who are going to give me a hard time. Rabbi, you said it wrong. Uh, if I said it wrong, I'm saying it up front. So he moved, and in a very short time, his visa was cleared, and he came to New York, came to America. Um, so this Oscar Rabinowitz saved the Rebbe's life. But that a chateva. There were other people as well. So the, Rebbe, the previous Rebbe writes to his father, I want you to know my son-in-law came today. Please tell your son. It was very important to him. So I, I, I wanted to with a Jew who some of you may have known. His name was Rabbi Edelman, David Edelman. He was a shliach of the Rebbe since like 1949 or something. Or rather, he passed away recently. So he was a very generously talkative man. And when he talked, I stopped and I listened. He always had good things to say. See, so he told me, I'm sorry? Ah, yeah, he's a lot of people's <laughs> grandfather. Um, so he told me that this Osher Rabinovich wasn't a chassid, but he had a very strong chassidic feeling. His father was a big chassid. And whenever he would go into the Rebbe, the Rebbe would stand up and embrace him and kiss him. The Rebbe wanted him to know that how much he appreciated what he did. So before the Rebbe was Rebbe, that was okay. But once the Rebbe became Rebbe, it bothered him that the Rebbe was getting up for him and kissing him and hugging him was a little much. And he sort of tried to explain to the Rebbe that maybe the Rebbe should cut back. And the Rebbe was not going to do that. The Rebbe wanted to know how he felt. So he stopped coming to the Rebbe. He said, the Rebbe's not going to hug me. The Rebbe's not embracing me. I'm not that kind of person. And he preferred not to come to you. Imagine, not to come to Yechidis, which is an incredible opportunity in his chus, because he says, the Lubavitcher Rebbe is not going to stand up for me and hug me and kiss me, doesn't matter what I did. I'm a lawyer with all due respect, you know. I think it's a very interesting little story. The other part of the story, which is incredibly compelling, is it was a Monday, like today. The same exact fias. It was a Monday. Chof Chassim was on a Monday. And the Rebbe told the story that when he got off the ship, so first of all, the previous Rebbe sent a whole bunch of people to, to greet him, to meet the Rebbe when the Rebbe came off the ship. The story that's, it's a true story. I heard it from Rabbi Groner myself. And Rabbi Groner was a bar mitzvah boy. Rabbi Groner from Australia was 13 years old. That's how long ago this was. And he was standing outside the previous Rebbe's room with his father, Aleyah Mashalim, to go into the previous Rebbe. This is 1941 for Yechidus for the bar mitzvah. And three men walked out of the previous Rebbe's room. One of them was Rabbi Jacobson. One of them was Rabbi Kazanovsky. I don't know who the third was. And they were very moved. They were clearly very moved. Something happened in that room that was very moving. And they saw Rabbi Groner's father. Rabbi Groner's father was a very special Jew. Ramot Chagroni was a very beautiful, beautiful, really, really. A, you look at his picture, he looks like a, a tzaddik. Mom is like a holy man. Rabbi Groner's father. And then Ramot you know what the Rebbe just told us? The Rebbe said, tomorrow my son-in-law is coming. And I want you to go greet him at the port. But I want you to know who you're going to greet. So he said to them, He's a bucky, he knows by heart the Shas Bavli and the Rishami, the Babylonian Shas and the Rishami, and all the Midrashim and the Zayar, all Sifri Kabbalah. And the Lakuta Teda with all the sources, Lakuta Teda is thousands and thousands of sources from the most obscure books. Lakuta Teda with all the sources. And, and he said he wears his hat, Dafka down, you know, he wears the fedora, the Rebbe didn't dress with an Abanish dress, and under his hat he has the whole Shas Bavli and the Rishami. 
he says every night he does chtsos, he mourns for the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. Three o'clock in the morning he's never asleep, either he's not gone to sleep yet or he's already woken up. And it was very exciting for them to hear this and they went to greet the Rebbe. So the Rebbe publicly said, I couldn't decide what should I do first. Should I first come to 770 or should I first go to the mikveh? To go into a Rebbe without going to a mikveh is not appropriate. He'd been on a ship for 11 days. There was no mikveh on the ship, right? I, I guess there was a mikveh, but it wasn't so easy to use. Um, and he says, to go into the Rebbe without mikveh, I couldn't. But if the Rebbe wants to see me, then I'm not going to make the Rebbe wait. So the Rebbe said, I couldn't make up my mind. Should I go to mikveh? Should I not go to mikveh? So the Rebbe said, in the end, it didn't matter. Because the Rebbe wouldn't see us for three days. They arrived on a Monday. The previous Rebbe didn't see them until Thursday. And the Rebbe explained why. The Fidekeb was not in the best of health. The Fidekeb, by nature, was an incredibly emotional man. I've heard many people describe much, much more emotional than our Rebbe was. The Fidekeb used to cry in a way that I never cried, really didn't cry. And he would laugh. Fidekeb would giggle, would laugh in a way that our Rebbe was much, much more... I don't know what the right word is, controlled, reserved, reticent, but he was a very emotional man and he was simply worried about his health. And the Rebbe had the, had the moichen, had the presence of mind, had the strength of character to wait until he felt like he had sufficiently calmed down before he would see them. So he waited till Thursday to see them and when he saw them, they went in separately. All this the Rebbe said in Efebring, and that's how I know. The, the Rebbe repeated this in Efebring, and the Rebbe said went in alone. The Rebbe's wife, the Fidik of his daughter, went in first and spent some time with her father. I don't know what they discussed, none of my business, right? And then the Rebbe went in. Yeah. And during those three days, and for the next few weeks, actually, the Rebbe and the Rebbe said moved into what is now the Rebbe's office. That's where they lived. They put two beds in that room, and they were hoping to make for them accommodations in 770, but after a few weeks... They took an apartment on President in New York. Um, so the Rebbe said this. He said, the Rebbe de Shved, this I just need to tell you this. The Rebbe de Shved does nish The previous Rebbe, or my father-in-law, the Rebbe, wouldn't see me till Thursday. Aber jenem Nacht hat man a ganze Nacht verbracht mit dem That night, that Monday night, we stayed up all night talking. All of them. That means... The Rebbe and the Rebetzin and their mother-in-law and their sister-in-law and their brother-in-law and their nephew. They spent the whole night, the family, the, the, the nucleus, the previous Rebbe's children sat the whole night talking to the Rebbe and the Rebetzin. And then the Rebbe says, Ah, in Kleinigkeit, the kingdoms are geratet for the Nazis, as the Rebbe said. Ah, no small thing. The children were spared, were saved from the Nazis. No, the previous Rebbe had a third daughter who didn't make it. She was killed in Treblinka. And the Rebbe and the Rebbe said, came. That's why the Rebbe said, Ah, we spent a whole night just chatting, schmoozing. In Kleinikai, the kingdoms of Hirat. Can you imagine? Children came from the Nazis. The rest of the story, I mean, the story is never going to end, right? But the Chsidim saw the Rebbe. And the Rebbe, you know how the Rebbe looked? Incredibly neat. Very, very useful. Just gorgeous. I mean, the Rebbe's physical countenance made your head turn. He was so beautiful, physically beautiful. There was such a beautiful man. Um, and the beauty was the inner beauty. You could see that this was not an ordinary man. You looked at the Rebbe's face, even when the Rebbe was 80. The Rebbe, the Rebbe, the Rebbe's, at the age of 80, the Rebbe was physically incredibly beautiful to look at. Physically, Pasha, gorgeous. It's a holiness. And 40 years before that, he was also very beautiful. Um, but he had no airs, you know, no noise, no tumul, and his gestures were very exact, very efficient, very quick. They walked in and walked out, did what he had to do, didn't waste any time. Um, and you had to observe him, you know, you had to observe him. So the Chassidim asked the Rebbe if the Rebbe would fabring, would, would lead a gathering. So the Rebbe said, until I see the Rebbe, until I see my father-in-law, I'm still on the boat. This is, I'm not here. And the Rebbe made him wait three days. So from Monday to Thursday, the Rebbe waited to see the previous Rebbe. And um, a, a little sweet story happened that I think is worth to mention. There was an old chassid, then he was old, 80 years ago, he was probably in his 70s, whose name was Rebbe David Shifrin. Rebbe David Shifrin was a chassid for the Rebbe Marash, old Lubavitcher chassid, there's pictures of him, a happy Jew who lived in America for many, many years, an important man. And he had, he, he, had a, he, was, he was a real chassid. He, he had a discerning eye. You couldn't fool him. 
So Wednesday and Thursday is Rosh Chodesh, like it is this year. Wednesday and Thursday is Rosh Chodesh. And uh, Rosh Chodesh, you take off your tefillin in the middle of davening because you don't daven Musaf with tefillin. So the Rebbe, was his, his room was across the hall, you know. He put on Tal's tefillin in his room. He came into the shul to daven, and when the davening was over, went back to his room. But Rosh Chodesh, since you take off your tefillin in the middle of davening, so the Rebbe did it in shul. And the Rebbe wore four pairs of tefillin, which is like a, it's a situation. It's a whole, you know, so people have never seen it. So everyone was ogling, they were looking at him, and probably the last time that Rebbe did it in public, because they were thinking, what's the big deal, you know? <laughs> in Poland, many people had four pairs of tefillin. It was a very rare thing to observe. But it's not really four pairs, it's two pairs and an extra shalosh with each. You know, an extra shalosh with Rashi, so you take out the shalosh of Rashi, you put on a different shalosh, then you put on the Rebbe Nutam, and you take out the shalosh of Rebbe Nutam, put on a different shalosh. And they watched the Rebbe do this in his very efficient way. You know, no noise. And Abdavid Shafin was an old man, and he stood, and he watched, and he watched, and he watched, and he watched. And he turned to the Bachram. I heard this from Saul Gordon, Saul Zangezunt, who was a kid then. He was, must have been 12 years old or 11 years old. He turned to the boys and he says, Kinderlach. I, I'm sorry, I'm so emotional. I know myself why I'm so emotional. Dos is the emes is Children, this is the real thing. This is the real thing. He watched the Rebbe put on film. That's what he said. He said, Kinderlach. This is the goods. This is the real. He was his impression. He passed away in '43. He never saw the Rebbe be a Rebbe, but he he got the Rebbe by watching him, watching him put on film. So today is an important date. We certainly mark it. We celebrate it. We honor it. And we're of course we're joining it with uh, our pre Gimel Tamas Fabrengen. This is our topic, right? I'm not supposed to talk about Kafkas Nissen. I'm supposed to talk about Gimel Tamas. I'm sorry. Whatever I want. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, talk about Gimel Thomas. I'm talking about Gimel. I, I, I prepared myself. I prepared some notes because there are certain things that I want to say. Um, first of all, I'll tell you a story. It's always good to start with a story. Um, I heard a story from a Jew who's now probably over 90. His name is Shalom Bed Dinizim. Shalom Bed is an old man. He lives, he lives he dives in a shawl in Crown Street. I was once at a Kiddish. And he was sitting and talking, and he told a story that in Crown Heights, many, many years ago, many years ago means 50 years ago, maybe even 60 years ago, there was a very, very prominent rabbi, his name was Rabbi Krieger, Rabbi Krieger. Rabbi Krieger was an Ashkenaz Jew, he was what he would call a misnaget. He was not only not a Lababach, he wasn't a chassid. But he was very learned, and his expertise was, he, he, he was involved in a certain speciality in halacha that made him a very important rabbi. And the rabbi had a very meaningful connection to him. He would speak to the Rebbe, he would visit the Rebbe, and the Rebbe would, he would, the Rebbe would send him Shalach Manus. He was one of the people the Rebbe sent Shalach Manus. So he was an important man, and he respected the Rebbe, the Rebbe respected him. It was a very beautiful relationship. So he told Shalom Bar Dizin, in other words, I heard the story second hand, that when he, he had a daughter, this is the 1959, 1960, 61, it's a long time ago, that's, that's 60 years ago. Like 60 years ago. His daughter was 31 years old at the time, and she developed heart disease. I think it was that early, maybe it was later, but I think it was actually the beginning of the 60s. And the uh, person has heart disease, what are you gonna do with heart disease? But they had developed then the open heart surgery. Today they have ways of doing open heart surgery without opening you up. But then it was open heart surgery. And it was all very new. And people were very afraid because not everybody uh, woke up from such an operation. And this Rabbi Krieger was beside himself. He had a daughter, she was 31 years old. She had a whole house full of little kids. And she was terribly, terribly ill. She needed to do this operation. Not doing the operation was terrible. Doing the operation was almost as terrible. Certainly was as frightful. And he didn't know what to do. He ran around all the holy rabbis. In New York in 1960, there were a lot of tzaddikim. You know, there were other rabbis, very prominent. The Bayana Rebbe was here, the Satma Rebbe was here, the Skvera, there were, there were holy people who you can go to for a bracha that the bracha would actually work. And the last place he went was, he was a Crown Heightser. He lived in Crown Heights. <laughs> he, he came to the local, he went to the Rebbe. And he walked into the Rebbe and he says, I'm, I'm really, really eating myself up. Should I do the operation? Should I not do the operation? I can't find peace for myself. So the Rebbe says to him, he, you should do the operation. And then the Rebbe says, would you like to know what they're going to do to your daughter? Would you like to understand what they're going to do? And he said, yeah. The Rebbe spent half an hour and he talked them through the surgery from the first incision until they wake her up. He just, 
he did a play by a half an hour. They would talk to him through the surgery. The entire process of open heart surgery, which was, I mean, even today, it's a very serious thing, but then it was incredibly complicated. And um, he, the Rebbe talked them through the entire operation. From the time they're going to make the initial incision until they're going to wake her up. And then the Rebbe said to him, I want you to know there will come a time, this is going to be so routine, people are not going to think twice about it. And of course, that's exactly how it played out. So he told Rabbi Drizen, I walked, he said in Yiddish, he said in Yiddish, I walked out of the Rebbe and he said, I knew I have a daughter. I find it very interesting that the Rebbe talked him through the whole operation. When the doctor walked out of the surgery, he said to Rabbi Krieger, he said, you know, I've done a few of these, many of these. I felt like somebody was holding my hand, that's what he said. I felt like somebody was, I've never done an operation like this. It was so efficient, it was so precise, it was so certain, it was so without fear. He said, I felt like somebody was holding my hand. I personally feel that when the Rebbe talked this man through the operation, it wasn't just his daughter, it was, Every person who's going to go through open heart surgery, the Rebbe was giving a koyach to doctors. That's my feeling. I, I, it's just a beautiful story. And then I uh, wanted to start with a story. So this is a story that I'm choosing to start with. Uh, we're coming to Gimel Thomas, and Gimel Thomas uh, still makes us very uncomfortable. You know, you know the story I'm a snagged one said. I find this tasteful. If this is un distasteful to you, I apologize. I, I think it's very cute. For a misnagger to say it, I think it's very cute. He said, What's the Babach Rebbe and Moshe Rabbeinu? He says, Everybody knows Moshe Rabbeinu passed away, no one knows when Moshe Rabbeinu is laying. Lubavitch Rebbe, they're not sure if he passed away or not, but everybody knows where he is. <laughs> I think it's hysterical. I think it's funny. <laughs> Gimel Thomas, uh, of course that Rebbe is alive, but we all, know where the, we, we all know where he is. When you need something, you know where to go. Gimel Thomas, late of nail. So, so the, be, the first thing needs to be said is that uh, this, uh, talking about a Rebbe, a Tzadik, a Nasi, a Yisrael, a Jew with an incredible... If you could close the bathroom door, I would appreciate that, yeah? Um, the Rebbe's Neshama is connected to the Neshama of each one of us. And first of all, before everything else, the Rebbe gives brachas. The Rebbe loves and blesses. You ever watch the Rebbe standing by the door of his room? And the group of people are standing there, and it's before Rosh Hashanah, and they're speaking to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe cannot stop, bless. He cannot, Macha Bracha, Mother Bracha, another Bracha. The Rebbe gives Brachas to each of us, to each of us, to all of us, and to each of us, and all kinds of things. I was thinking in today's Parsha, you have the story of Kairach. And one of the details of the story of Kairach is the Ketiris, by the incense. And in our Parsha, something very unusual plays out. Is ketedus a good thing or a bad thing? The answer is, depends how you use it. If you use it in, inappropriately, it's terrible. And if you use it appropriately, it heals. Kedach uses the ketedus and it costs him his life. The Jewish people experience a plague. And Adon Akrain takes the very, very same ketedus and he stops a plague. The Rebbe gives ketedus. He gives good ketedus, you know, brachas, ketedus. He gives all kinds of brachas. And the remez is the hint is that the word ketedus in Aramaic is the same as the word keshet in Hebrew, which means a bond, like hiskashos. The, the Aramaic word for hiskashos is ketida, keter, with a tes, not with a tof. And that's what ketedus is. It's a Hebrew word, but it has a hint in Aramaic. It binds us and it connects us. And I think, I think it's important that I say this. We have to remember that uh, before everything else, the Rebbe is a Rebbe. It's very hard to explain what a Rebbe means because the Rebbe is so holy and has so little in common with us, really. has so little in common with us. And somehow, he's cool. You know what I'm saying? He's cool. He's, he's <laughs> the girls in high school would say, not he's with us. He's with it. He's on the ball. He gets it, yeah. He understands us. He understands our Yetzirah. He understands our weaknesses. I'm involved with people. That's what I do. Um, Inside Hasidus is my life. But I've been involved in Hasidus. You've got to be involved with the people, listen to the classes. So I'm involved with a particular person who's not feeling very good about themselves. And how can I write to the Rebbe? And I'm this hypocrite, that hypocrite. Listen, we're all in the same boat. You know, some people just are more preoccupied with it than others. And that's the whole thing. The Rebbe is this incredibly holy man. And if it was up to him, each one of us would be as holy as he is. And you know, 
he, he wouldn't even think of such a big deal. Of course, you know, you're connected to a tzaddik, you become a tzaddik yourself. But evidently, it ain't so simple, you know. It's supposed to be, but it isn't. It isn't exactly, it isn't completely. And the Rebbe understands, the Rebbe understands. And the Rebbe blesses, and the Rebbe pays attention with a tenderness, with a gentleness, with a patience, with an understanding that's a reflection of not where he is, but where we are. I tell my students often, you know, people have different attitudes about going to the oil. Some people go very infrequently, some people go very often. I say, when well, you go to the oil, you don't have to write anything, you just stand there. Just be. Just be in the presence of the Rebbe. Experience that peacefulness, that unbelievable peacefulness that you experience when you go to the to the oil and to experience that connection and the Rebbe gets us he gets us and even though it's so many years so many years I mean, there's a whole generation of children it's a whole generation of children and now there's already a second generation that are post Gimel Thomas but uh, we get it also we understand a little bit that we're dealing with a tzaddik a tzaddik of such a level the time and space and the physical condition really doesn't make a difference. You know, when I look at my children, I look at my students, and I see how genuine they are. When they go to the Rebbe, when they go to the Oyo, they really have a connection to the Rebbe, and I, I marvel at it. I, I can't, it's just incredible to me. It's be, if you say, you know, the Rebbe said once, you can spend your entire life in Quran Heights and have no relationship with the Rebbe. You can never meet him and be a big chassid because what makes the Rebbe a Rebbe or makes us chassidim is not, you know, how much time we spend in his presence and how many minutes we waste in Yechidis and how many letters we write to him, but how much we understand his purpose, his purpose and his role, what he wants from us and what he gives to us. What he wants from us that we should good Jews. What he wants from us that we should find time and space and energy to embrace another Jew and what he offers is a lot of love and a lot of understanding and a, a chronic kick in the pants a never stopping new move <laughs> Gibbs Haruk stop moving so slowly he does it nicely when I do it I frighten my students away when the Rebbe does it you say kick me again <laughs> you have to know how to do it <laughs> so we have to we have to remember this we go to Gimel Thomas what I'm trying to say is it's it's a bad idea it's also wrong but it's a bad idea think about the imminent coming of Gimel Thomas and say, oh my God, here comes Gimel Thomas again. I, for many, many years I felt that way. And maybe that's bad, you know. I used to, oh my God, Gimel Thomas is coming. Um, but that's not how it is. It's not good. We want Mashiach, we want to see the Rebbe. But it's not all no Gimel Thomas. This is a date that's very, very important. It's about our relationship with the Rebbe. Mm -hmm. It's about what we do, how we live our lives, and how we try to reflect the values that he teaches mm -hmm. and the teachings that he provided and the instruction and the encouragement that he gives and there's also a, an enormous amount an enormous amount of ah, asach, asach, a lot of love a lot of love a lot of love so I made myself a list of things to talk about my list is too long but I'll get through part of it at least I made a list of things that I want to talk about when oh. you want to learn Talmud, you go to Barash Yeshiva, right? When you want to learn Halacha, you go to a Rav. What do you go to a Rebbe for? What's, what's a Rebbe's job? What does a Rebbe do? What do you need a Rebbe for? I mean, silly question. If you ever met one, you know what you need a Rebbe for. But, right, where did Moshe Rabbeinu? Moshe Rabbeinu was not a Rosh Yeshiva, although he was a Rosh Yeshiva. Moshe Rabbeinu was not a Rav, although he was a Rav. Moshe Rabbeinu was a Rebbe. What's a Rebbe? What's a Rebbe? I'll tell you two little stories. The first is, there was a, a young man who is very famous, very well known, who passed away in 1936, it's a little while ago. His name was the Rugged Shavu. You've heard the name the Rugged Shavu, right? The Rugged Shavu talked about, the Rebbe talked about the Rugged Shavu more than anybody else. The, uh, people would say that the Rebbe considered the Rugged Shavu his teacher. The Rugged Shavu invented a very original approach to learning Talmud, to Gemara, to Nigla which is extraordinarily philosophical. And the Rebbe was so enamored, the Rebbe couldn't get enough of him. The Rebbe was completely um, um, excited, I'm using the wrong word, by the Rebbe approach to Torah. He was a genius. He was an incredible genius. Uh, the Arsameach, who was the co-rov in Dvinsk, the Arsameach, 
he was the misnagdish of He was also a very big Talmud Chacham. Mm-hmm. They were both Rabbanim in the same city. He used to say the Rabbi Chava doesn't have a good memory. He just always learned everything. He just learned it. He just, he just went through the whole Shas every day. So you never, you can't forget. You just learned an incredible mind. And he was sharp as a razor. He was, to be around him was lethal. He could say things to you that were so upsetting that you would never forget it for the rest of your life. He was very sharp. He wasn't at Ebbe. He was at Ov. And when he was young, say 18, 19 years old, he, he knew the whole Torah. He just knew it all. And he, he understood it incredibly deeply. He had a very deep mind. And he decided he's going to go all over Eastern Europe and find people who know something, but on his definition, his level of knowledge, you know. So he went from city to city and he went into the rabbis and to the Rashi Yeshivas. And usually, he was an 18-year-old boy. Within 15 minutes, he was literally mopping the floor with them. He, if you were wrong, you knew it. He didn't keep a secret. He, he, he would tell it to you straight, you know. The story that they tell about the Rav Chavit is that there was a very respectable rabbi who met him. And the Rav was very nice to him. So he told the Rav Chavit, you know, you're famous for being Mavatal Rabbanim. You're not respectful of rabbis and you're being so nice to me. I'm surprised. He says, yeah, I'm disrespectful of rabbis, but simple people I treat very, very well. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was him. <laughs> Simple people I treat very, very nicely. He was a rabbi, you understand? This was the Nugget Shavit. Anyway, he went from place to place, and almost in every city he came to, he met very, I'm, I'm sure there were wonderful Jews, and by today's standard, they'd be big time with the But they were not supercomputers. The Shavit had an incredible brain. But he wasn't the only genius on the planet. He was one of the only geniuses, but there were others. And occasionally he would meet his match. He would meet a man of genius that could spar with him, that could go at it, you know, blow for blow. And then he was in paradise. They, they, you know, they would figuratively box, you know, they were not throwing fists, they were throwing pages of gamut at each other. And they could argue for hours. And he didn't mind losing. He loved Malcham Tashal He loved the spar. He loved the, 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 uh, the debate, which he... He, he had a hard time finding people that he could debate with on his level because he was bred in everybody. And he came to Lublin. Lublin had a rabbi and Lublin had a rebbe, a rov and a rebbe. The rov was a Lubavitcher chassid, Rabbi Shneir Zalman Fratke, the Teiras chassid. He was much older than the Ragachava. When the Ragachava came to Lublin, the Ragachava was in his teens, the Teiras chassid probably was in his 60s or 70s. He spent the last years of his life in Israel. He passed away in 1909, I believe. And he was, this was the 18, it's the 1870s or 80s when the story happened. So he was much older than he was also an incredible genius. He walked into his house and he starts to throw pages and the two of them are killing each other. They're, they're pounding into each other like two bull elephants, you know. They're just, they're just throwing everything they have. When he walked out of the Lubliner's house, he was in a daze. He, he, this was a match, this was a real match. He was overwhelmed by his genius. And he was dizzy. And the people heard him walking through the streets of Lubin, muttering under his breath, a dead altar can learn, and that old man can learn, that old man. He was overwhelmed. But he asked him, this old man, is there anybody else in Lublin I should go see? As he met somebody who was really a genius, is there anybody else I should go and see? He says, yeah, the Lublin Rebbe. The Lubin Rebbe is very famous, you probably heard his name. It's a Tzadik HaKoyen. The Tzadik HaKoyen is one of the most uh, frequently used for him today. His Hasidus is very popular, even Misnagdim learned it, because he was an incredible genius. He knew the whole Torah. It was a great Talmud Chacham. And he, but he was not a Rav, he was a Rebbe. So the Rav walks into his house, but he has, he has a recommendation. He knows that this person is a scholar, right? Walks into his house and the Lublin Rebbe is sitting with his hands folded, very collected, and uh, the Rebbe Chavez starts to throw pages at him. You know, that's how you would argue. You would, you would come up with an idea and you would present it by just quoting page numbers and you would go to him and then the argument would fight and they, they would have fun. And the Lublin is sitting with his hands folded and he's not saying a word. So the Rebbe Chavez is trying, see, he tries harder. He tries to find something more provocative and more disturbing to say to get under this Rebbe's skin to he wants to fight he wants to have fun he wants to box you understand anyway the Lublina Rebbe is not playing and he waits for him to finish he waits for him to come up for here he waits for him to finish finally Dragachava realizes that this rabbi is not going to argue with me so he stops and when he finishes the Lublina Rebbe told him 
what I think it's the most concise depiction of the whole of Hasidus. I think it's such a great story. It's a wonder. I love telling this story. He said to him in Yiddish. I'll say it in Yiddish, translate it into English. He says, Junger man, ich bin amal euch gewen as evido. Gefahren über die Welt und gewissen, dass keine kenne ich lernen. Aber es ist nicht kein Leben. Gege findet sich ein Leben. Soll er die Reis lernen, wie man darf dienen in der Mähbischte. He says, young man, he says, I was once just like you. I was once 18 and I was, was smarter than everybody else and I went around showing people how dumb they were. And I was smarter than everybody else. But it's not a life. It's not a life. It's not a life. Go find yourself a Rebbe. Let him teach you how to serve God. Go find yourself a Rebbe. Let him teach you how to serve God. That's what a Rebbe gives. A wonderful story. And the second story that I want to share is that when the Rogachava passed away. This same Rogachava passed away. He lived in Poland, which was very poor, and they raised 15,000 zlotas. 15,000 zlotas then was a, an exorbitant amount of money. First they raised it for his medical expenditures. He went to Vienna to see doctors, but he passed away. And then that money was used to literally bring his remains back into Poland, and he was buried in Dvinsk. You know the story. <laughs> this is Jewish politics. The, the Warsaw Jewish community, which numbered in the hundreds of thousands, they paid most of those 15,000 zlotas. So they figured they're entitled to bury him in Warsaw. But he was the Dvinsk head off, and he's supposed to be in Dvinsk. So they planned that when the train would come to Warsaw, they would take his remains off the train, they'd bury him, and then they'd ask the Dvinsk community to take him to Dentator, to sue them, you understand? So the Dvinsk Echevre found out about it, and they gave a bribe to the train driver, and they just skipped the scab. A Polish am I, if you understand Polish, you didn't. So they skipped right by, he's buried in Dvinsk, where he was around for many years. The previous Rebbe was ill at that time, and the previous had no money for medicine, no money for doctors. And the Richard Masmid, the great Chosid, wrote, Kola Oilam Reyeshim al Sar HaTayda. Vi al Sar HaLakim Shoko, everybody is so preoccupied with the Sar HaTayda. The minister of the Torah. But they forgot about the minister of God. He was very disturbed that the Rebbe didn't have what he needed. We learn in the Vata Tetzave. Rebbe's give us a connection to Hashem. That's what they do. They don't give us data. They do that too, but that's not their role. Information, knowledge, education, scholarship. They give us faith. They give us intimacy with Hashem. That's what a Rebbe does. His personality, his presence. A tzaddik is a yid. You look at a rabbi and you say, yeah, there's got to be a God. If someone like this exists, then, then there's a God. I don't know how, but if, if, if there's somebody like this, then there is an Ebishter. Rebbe, a rabbi injects us with faith. And it's always true, but it's particularly true now, that it's not for free. You don't get the faith, you know, by eating a piece of cake and sleeping. You have to cultivate what the Rebbe gives us. The Rebbe gives us God. A Rebbe, a Rebbe gives us God. Not that there is a God. That there's a proof. For that you can go to a rabbi, any rabbi. But an intimacy. A sense of Hashem. Which is what faith, what Emunah really means. This is what a Rebbe does. This is what Gimel Tamas is. First and foremost, that the Rebbe, our Rebbe, my Rebbe, your Rebbe, my children's Rebbe, your Rebbe, your Rebbe, your Rebbe, your Rebbe, your Rebbe, all the little kids in the gives you first and foremost he gives you a moon in Hashem he makes Hashem real because he's real and his connection to Hashem is real and he has a a magical ability to touch Jewish souls that's what Tzadikim do they touch the Neshama they wake up the Neshama and they give us a, a real intimate connection a real emissa connection with HaKadosh Baruch that's number one what's number two on my list you gotta be besimcha. Huh? We're lubabs. We're lubabs. We gotta be besimcha. The Rebbe said about himself. The Rebbe said about himself that by nature he's an introvert. He's not a happy person. The Rebbe's an introvert. The Rebbe's personality is very controlled. He said in contrast to the previous Rebbe. Says the, the Rebbe, the previous Rebbe and I have very different natures. He would say. Um, and his nature was he was a scholar, he was a book person and book people don't tend to be particularly jovial, they tend to be very earnest and very calculated and very measured and the Rebbe said I changed my nature completely the Rebbe was a man not only he radiated joy, he didn't tolerate if he saw a lack of joy by anybody else 
And the Rebbe said, it didn't come to me easy. I had to work very hard on developing this new character of being besimcha. Uh, there was a Polish Jew who had a relationship with the Rebbe. He wasn't exactly a chassid, but he had a relationship with the Rebbe, and he, he was able to say things to the Rebbe that you or I wouldn't say. So in the mid-70s, I heard it from someone who heard it from him. He walked into the Rebbe and said in Yiddish, Lubavitch Rebbe was machst, which means in English, Rabbi, how you doing? How you doing? Lubavitch Rebbe, how you doing? It's not exactly respectful, but the, the truth is, someone needed to say it, and he said it. So without a hesitation, the Rebbe says, Ich bin tomed besimcha. I'm always happy. The Rebbe made joy a very basic part of our Hasidic paradigm. A person has to be besimcha. Now, when you're four, oh, maybe when you're two, I don't know how these things work. You look at children, look at little kids. It's, you look at, you watch, I have now grandchildren that are little. And I love my grandchildren. Why? Because they don't judge me yet, right? They haven't reached that age yet. The oldest just turned five, so we're getting there. Um, <laughs> now, I'm not good for playing with grandchildren. I'm an old man, but I like to sit and watch them. And they're just so free. They're just so free. You say, wait a minute. When are they going to lose that? When is that beauty? You want to call it naivete, you call it naivete, but that's not, they, they're having fun. All kids, all kids are free. And then, and then they're not so free, huh? You know, when the kids go into nursery and then they go into pre, to, to kindergarten and the pre one you could start seeing the, the children separating already then you know the kids who don't do so well in school who are not so socially adept that the other kids hit them bully them in some cases and you see them withdraw you see their joy but when they're a year and a half two years old and they're mommy's favorite toy their kids are just so wonderfully free and happy hey what happens what <coughs> happens it's called life yeah it's called having adults around that's what it's called we ruin it with our reality huh? with our concerns with our worries with our fears but when you're looking at a little child, you, you see that joy. So the, psycho, the, psycho, the, psych, the psychotherapist says, of course, they're naive. They don't know anything. And Hasid says, no, they're pure. That's what God made. That's how a human being looks in the image of God. Free and happy because he lives in God's world. He's coming, he or she, these children are coming from, from a place of real joy. The Neshama in Ganeidin is very happy. It's an environment of happiness. This world... It's also a place of joy, but it's not for free. It takes an effort, yeah? And then we watch these kids grow up, we watch them struggle, and then they look like us. <laughs> but guess what? We're also chassidim. You don't become ois chassidim when you turn four. You know, in my experience, the, chassidim, the children are most chassidish when they're like 13, 14, or 15. I wish they'd do it when they were like 23, 24, 25, you know? It would be a lot more constructive. Um, whatever, I don't mean to bring up issues that I don't want to explain right now but but when it comes to this particular factor the idea that we live in Hashem's world and that's enough reason that the Rebbe say this world is a garden right Bossi Lagani this is Hashem's garden every one of us every one of us has got stuff every one of us has many reasons many excuses for why we're not walking around jovial and one of them is we don't people to call us an idiot that's also one of the reasons yeah ha huh. but the Rebbe had a thousand times as many reasons as we have. You know why? Because every one of us dumped on him. No, it's not a joke. All of our times, I go to the oil a lot this year because I'm having a hard year. I'm dumping. I'm like just dumping like a sewer. And maybe say something nice. So I, I sort of made a in my own head. When I go, I should say a basura teva. My last trip, I forgot, you know. We all come to the oil with our garbage. And we have lists and lists and lists. How come he didn't break? They never read every letter. Someone told me a, a cheshman, I read it in the book yesterday, 90,000 letters a year, 90,000 letters a year, 90,000 letters a year. He opened every piece of mail himself. He didn't answer every piece of mail. He answered many of them, but he opened every piece of mail, took every piece of mail to the oil. The kept track of these pieces of paper, literally, in a superhuman way. And he read all of our tzadahs. And he... He came out of his room with such energy. And he gave this energy to us. Why? You know, the famous expression from the Mela Premish Landed. You know, 
when you're connected on high, you don't fall. Well, we're not connected on high, but we're connected to the Rebbe. And um, this is what the Rebbe wants of us. And you know what? He's really right. It's a good idea. Your life is not going to get any worse if, you're, if you tell yourself, I'm going to have a positive attitude. And it's not going to get any better if you walk around miserable because you're being very realistic and very grown up and very responsible. I'm not saying we should neglect our challenges, but the definition of a chassid is a happy person. It's really true. The definition of a chassid is a happy person. And chassidim are not naive. They're not. They're just chassidim. They're just connected to the Ebesh, the Tashem. And it gives them koyach. You know, the Rambam talks about joy. So the Rambam says about joy one thing, which has two translations. He says, you should know joy is avoid gedoyla. What is avoid? It's a great service. But in those two words, he's saying two opposite things. Number one, it's very important. And number two, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. But it's good. And the Rebbe, there was never a Rebbe, never a Rebbe, who demanded from his Hasidim that they should always walk around Pashat in a good mood. I, I knew old Jews who were always besimcha, and some of them were quite deep and quite burdened. But they were chassidim. And they shared their, their happiness of life. And as we go to Gimel Tamas, this is one of the things that we should consider, right? From the faith, from the faith, from the first point that I made, comes the joy. Number three. What's the third thing? What's next on my list? Huh? After Muna and Simcha. Action. The most important thing is a deed. And uh, again, this is something which the Rebbe took to an extreme. Far beyond what earlier Rebbe's did. And of course, it has a lot to do with who we are, our generation, our time, and our world. The Rebbe didn't care what your motivation was. He just kidding. you did good things. You know, like the halacha is. If a rich man loses his wallet and a poor man finds it, he gave tzedakah. Why? You helped somebody. You didn't mean to. Maybe you're not even happy about it, but you gave tzedakah. And the Rebbe didn't worry about motivation. Just do good deeds. And I want to speak to this for a moment. I want to talk to this priority of action. Judaism is accused of being a religion of ritual. Right? That's the label. Right? The people who are smart put everything in a little box. Some religions are religions of faith, and Judaism is a religion of ritual. And of course, that's not true. Judaism is not a religion of ritual. I don't like calling Judaism a religion. It's a truth. It's the truth. But Judaism is a religion of ritual also. And there's a very good reason. I remember being a boy, a teenager, and my friend and I went on Miftzayim, and my friend had so much chutzpah, unbelievable. Had chutzpah for 10 people. And he would push people to put on film or whatever it was he wanted them to do. And I remember he came into a certain person who was going through something in their lives, and he was pushing them that they should they should keep Taz and Meshbacha. What's a 16-year-old boy telling a girl to keep Taz and Meshbacha? But that's the fact of life. That's what happened. <laughs> and she said, that's none of God's business. And he said, it's absolutely God's business. I remember watching this argument. She's none of God's business. He was 16, literally. I was 15 and a half, and he was 16. It's none of God's business. That's my business. And you know, it is God. Okay, so now, now, now. So how does the criticism go? How does the criticism go? How does the criticism go? The criticism goes that God's busy with little details. What they call orthodoxy, right? That's the right word. You have to do it exactly this way, and you do it a little bit wrong, then it's not good, and you have to do it over and in the wrong time, you did it in the wrong place. And it's so technical and it's so full of details. What about faith? What about joy? What about prayer? What about connection? Everybody's so busy with the details, with the yeah. What's the answer to that question? What is the real answer to that question? Why does it bother you? I don't mean you or you. I mean, why does it bother you that Judaism is the religion of ritual? Why? Why does it bother you? Because you don't want to do it. That's why. Because you don't want to do it. Mm. Why don't you want to do it? Because it makes you uncomfortable. That's exactly why God wants you to do it. To be a religious person who goes uh, Sunday morning into a, into a special place and meditates, it's nice. But that's nothing to do with their life. You don't become a different person because you take a couple hours off a week and you go and you meditate. You become a different person when God follows you around from the kitchen to the bathroom to the bedroom to the front door. And wherever you go, he's, do, no, no, not like that. I'm sorry, that's wrong. Gotta do it. <laughs> and when the kids get old and they start being your assistant rabbis and they have a whole bunch of opinions of a chai. You see, 
Here's the fact of life. Judaism exists because of mitzvahs. The, the idea that we do actions is an anchor. It's mamish an anchor. Everybody in this room, I, I, I would imagine, okay, maybe not, but everybody in this room has moments, has moods, okay? Sometimes we're really into God, sometimes we're really not into God, and sometimes we can take him or leave him. There's all, we, we all fluctuate, right? We're not always in the mood of telling everybody about our fluctuations and our moods, but, but the mitzvahs never change. We always do the mitzvahs. When we're in a good mood, we do it very well. We're in a poor mood, we do it with a sour face, but we do it. That holds us. That if I go through a difficult period, and my relationship with the Abish is challenged, but I do the mitzvahs, I behaviorally give my time, my body, my wealth to Hashem and I maintain that connection. I'll come around. I'll come around. And it's so important. I mean, look at, you look at you know, what's the contribution of the Rebbe? Miftayim, right? right? The Rebbe Rashab created Taim Khatmim. The free Erika Rebbe had Mercedes Nefesh. And the Rebbe is Miftayim. Now, it doesn't sound fair, you know. Taim Khatmim sounds cool. Mercedes Nefesh sounds upsetting. But Miftsayim, really? That's what he did? The people should be... Miftsayim is huge. What a concept. What a, you go over to a strange man or woman that you've never seen before, never going to meet them again, and you ask them <coughs> the single most offensive question in the world. <laughs> Literally. Are you Jewish? To do Miftsayim in Israel is not half as difficult. No. It's by a, by a, by a, by a, a percentage of 10, because <coughs> you don't have to ask that first question. It's so offensive, it really is. Today, most of the people know what's the next question, so they're not insulted by the first question. Everybody knows what Lubavitch is, and we put on the film, so they're happy to do it, or they're not happy to do it, but they know what's coming. When I was growing up, people would be so, excuse me? What did you ask me? It's a very personal thing. And then you ask them to do a mitzvah. And my God, they did it. Now, we get so upset that not everybody listens to us, but you've got to think about it from their point of view. Why does one person stop? in the middle of the street and put on film and take Neshek and, and start to cry and tell you I'm really going to do it and they send you a load and they, you know, thank you very much send you pictures on Shabbos of them lighting the candles with their wife and their husband and children why? why does it work? why? why does Mephzayim work? why does Mephzayim work? so there's a story with the previous Rebbe a story with the previous Rebbe that uh, in 19... 18 or 19, there was a, a wealthy chassid by the name of Shmuel Gerari who found a treasure of letters. Letters that were presumably supposedly written by the Baal Shem Tev and the Baal Shem Tev's disciples and Baal Shem Tev's friends and the Magid and the Baal Shem Tev. It was a priceless treasure of, of, uh, of, uh, of correspondence which was found in an archive in, in, in the Ukraine someplace. Turns out they're not originals, they're copies. But our Rabbeim said that they were authentic. There's a bit, just so recently in the paper, a whole controversy about it again. But the Rabbeim, the previous Rebbe, the Rebbe Rashab, who saw the whole collection, said they were authentic. And the Rebbe said, in those letters, amongst the letters that were not published, you have Shemus of Kabbalah. You have names of Hashem and Kabbalah. You can't forge that. A phony can't do it because he just doesn't know the material. The Rebbe said, I know that this is authentic because I saw all the documents. You didn't see them. And the Rebbe, of course, was saying, I also am a maven in Kabbalah, and you couldn't bluff. You can't bluff this. Anyway, so they brought this entire, so Shmuel guy brought the whole thing. It cost him a lot of money. He bought the entire collection. He was a very rich man. He brought it to the Rebbe Rashab as a gift, the previous Rebbe's father. And he took the stack, and he divided them into two piles. So these are authentic, and these are inauthentic, because the letters were copied, and they were copied in haste. Some of them were copied so poorly that they no longer reflect the original. So he made it into two piles. Now the previous Rebbe walked around telling everybody he's a second class businessman, he's not a special Jew. So they took the same stack and they brought it to the previous Rebbe and he made the same division. These are authentic and he got it 100% like his father. So when he was done, the Chassidim said, you know, you act like you're just a regular person. You just disclosed that you have Ruch HaKadosh because we brought this collection to your father and he did exactly, it was hundreds of letters. It was, it was hundreds of letters. So he said, nah, it's not a miracle. I mean, it's not a miracle. He says, it's very simple. Ayid is get lechkait. Adovah shebegedusha is get lechkait. Get lechkait, so get lechkait tzitzach, which means a Jew is godliness. An artifact of holiness is godliness. Godliness and godliness have a magnetic pull. So I picked it up. 
if I felt like I have a relationship with it, it's good. Otherwise, I put it in the other pile. Now, I would try that it wouldn't exactly work. I don't know why. I'm also Jewish. I'm also godly. But apparently, it's not so simple. But the whole idea of a mitzvah, and it's true in our lives, Rabbi Isai, it's true in our lives. We're from, we're Orthodox, we're Hasidim, we're ultra, how, how many ultras we are, ultra once, ultra twice, ultra three times. The mitzvahs are not a prison. And doing it correctly, you know that famous story with this man, who you see it in the videos of the gem. He went into the Rebbe with his wife and his father-in-law. He says, I wasn't interested in seeing the Rebbe at all. I only went in because I was their chaperone. He drove, he flew from California with them. And he wasn't even going to the Rebbe. He wasn't going to write a note. He wasn't going to write a letter. And the secretary told him, if you don't write a note, you, can't, you have to stay outside. You can't go in. And as much as he wasn't interested, but he wasn't a chutzpinik, he wasn't a, a less than a person. So he wrote a note. But he didn't really consider the note that important. And his note he wrote, if God is so great, why does he care so much about the details? That's what he wrote. If God is so great, why does he care so much about the details? So there's a whole story which I'm not going to tell you now because the clock has no heart. Um, and the Rebbe turned to him finally. The Rebbe spoke to his father-in-law, then spoke to his wife, and then the Rebbe turned to him. And the Rebbe said, I don't understand your question. So he figured maybe the Rebbe has a problem with English. He grew up in yeshiva, he spoke Yiddish, was his first language. He starts telling it to the Rebbe in Yiddish. And the Rebbe says, I got it, I understand English. And the Rebbe says two words. The details are for us. The details are for us. He said he would never thought of it that way. He always thought that God's like this angry old guy, you know, keeping the score. But you did it right, you did it wrong, I'm going to give you a check, I'm going to give you an X, I'm putting you in the, in the penalty box. The details are for us. Torah and mitzvahs connect us to Hashem precisely because they're inconvenient. <laughs> doing the actions it's a lot you know you have a good day and you're in a very spiritual mood you can sit and meditate it's very important and it's very wonderful but we're here because for thousands of years people did mitzvahs they were not in the mood and this is so important in the Rebbe's paradigm in our own lives being from being exact in Yiddishkeit which uh, should become depressing or angry but it's important it's important because it anchors us. Spirituality is spirituality. And actions by themselves are not spirituality. But it keeps us constant. And certainly the idea of Mefzoyim, which is the Rebbe's brainchild, it's his chap. It's an amazing thing. How many millions of Jews have done mitzvahs at random, you know, ad hoc, because of the Rebbe. Literally millions of Jews who haven't done a mitzvah before, a mitzvah since. You know, the Rebbe calls it Abbas Yisrael. The Rebbe's planting seeds. The Rebbe's waking up Jewish souls. And he knows you want to get a Jew quick. Don't give him a speech. Don't give him a philosophy. Don't argue him about God. <laughs> I want to say give him a piece of chant, but I don't know how big a mate for that is. But chant was also pretty good. Yeah, Put on film with him. See that she lights a candle. It's huge. It's huge. Because an action, is it really is. It really is life-changing. It really does change our life. So what's number four? Number four is chinuch. Raising our children. Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu is a pretty successful guy. You know that. <laughs> Avram Avinu is a pretty successful man. How many billions of people believe in God? How many billions of people believe in God? It's Avram Avinu. It's his thing. He introduced the world to the idea of Eneid Movade, one God, monotheism, one God. And I'm not talking about Jews. Avraham Avinu is a very, very successful man. He's gotten billions of people all across the globe to say, yeah, the, and sometimes people are, have more of a connection to this God than they'll even admit to themselves. This is all Avraham Avinu. But there's another thing, huh? Avraham Avinu introduced to the world the phenomenon of kindness. Now that may sound like, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Avraham Avinu said, you see a hungry person, don't take away his shirt and say he's going to die anyway feed him. When you see a person who's, God forbid, passed away, don't take his shoes, bury him. When you see a person who has a need, give. It was such a radical idea. Why should I give him? Let him take care of himself. Why should I give him? Let him take care of himself, right? Avraham Avinu lived near a community called Sudaim. 
I don't know your politics, but Stein was strict Republican right wingers. You know, why should I give you? You didn't do well in school. You failed in the school. You have failure. Why should I give you money? Earn it your own way. Now, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm just a an equal opportunity provocateur. It works at this particular moment. Tomorrow I'll tell you something else. <laughs> but Avram said, "No, be kind. Be kind. Why should I be kind?" He didn't say, "Cause tomorrow he'll be kind back." He said, "Because it's right." Because it's right. Now think about the world in which we live. Just compare to 100 years ago. Just compare, anybody who knows history. You think about the post-Holocaust world, post-Second World War world, the United Nations, as much as we like to talk about how terrible those, those organizations are, yeah? How much kindness is there in the world? And I'm not talking about Jews. I'm not even talking about America. America is the kindest nation that ever existed. Without even a question. We're just unbelievably kind. But there's so much. It's all on Avram Avinu. It's all on Avram Avinu. Think about it. Avram Avinu said to the world, someone needs food, give him. And if he can't afford it, don't charge him. Avram Avinu created a precedent that today is so universal, right? <laughs> all the atheists say that they own kindness. <laughs> it's Avram Avinu's trick. You know, it's one group he gave God, the other group he gave kindness. But he's winning on both sides of the aisle. That's Avram Avinu. Avraham Avinu gave the world God, Avraham Avinu gave the world kindness, but he gave the world a third gift. And that's child rearing. You don't have babies and let them run around the streets and figure it out. You raise them. And I'm going to say something terrible, girls. Okay, listen, even though you're not going to like it. You raise your children to be like you. I tell them to be better than you. Okay, fine. But at least, like, you raise your children to be like you. One of my kids said to me, Ty, why couldn't you just raise us? We should figure it out ourselves. Yeah. One of my children said that way, which is quite disturbing. <laughs> I said, because I have to raise you to be like something. I can't raise you to be like nothing. Now, if you choose a different path, so you're going to have to struggle with it. But I have to give you something, and all I can give you is myself. I have nothing else to give. And here's the thing which is compelling. It says in the Chumash, in Pasha's Vayeda, Hashem has a muse. In, in Pasha's Vayeda, a muse. Hashem is having a conversation with himself. And he says, Hashem Omar Hamachas Ani Me Avraham Asher Ani Oiseh. Avraham Ho Yeh Le Goy God, whatever you want yourself. Then it says, Ki Yedaitev. Rashi says, Lashon Chiba, I love this man. Hashem, God Almighty says in the Bible, in the Pentateuch, I love him. I don't love him because he taught the world about God. I don't love him because he taught the world about kindness. I love him because he's teaching his children what he believes. It's in Chumash. This is not Rashi or Gemara. This is Chumash without Rashi. But Avraham Avinu is giving his children his values. And he's giving his children his values in such a way that they're going to perpetuate them. The third, Avraham gave the world three gifts. The one that Hashem says, I love him. Is not for monotheism, it's not for kindness, it's for chinuch. Raising our kids, it's very difficult to do, and we gotta do it. We have to raise our children. We can't let our kids grow up. You don't raise your kids if you buy them nice clothes and give them good vacations. You raise your kids if you teach them values, you teach them Torah, you teach them menschlichkeit, you teach them Avas Yisrael. And it's very hard, it's very, it's so complicated. You know, I have this whole speech, which I'm not doing now, but. Um, I don't have time to tell you the whole thing, but two parents, one parent was very afraid that his child would be taken advantage of, so he was always lying to his child that no one should be able to trick him. And the other parent raised his child that when his child did an act of kindness, if he didn't do it genuinely enough, he said to him, you didn't do it with your whole heart. The second parent was the Rebbe Rashab and the child was the previous Rebbe. And the Rebbe started to cry. Cried terribly and his mother walked in and says, he's seven years old. What do you want from him? And the Rebbe Rashab said, no, 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 we have to teach him. Now, I don't know if you should try with your seven-year-old. You're not the Rebbe Rashab, and the, your son is probably not the free to get Rebbe. But we, Chinuch is very, it's our responsibility that we have, and it absolutely is giving them our values. And as you said, as we give our children our values, we rediscover them for ourselves. And the laziness, or the apathy, or the I don't have time that sets in over the course of our adult lives is sometimes redeemed, you know? Our children make us better. But we have to raise, always hard to live in the kind, we have to raise our children. And I want to speak to one idea specifically. 
The Rebbe made service Hashem. But the Rebbe made the army of Hashem. The Rebbe made the army of Hashem. When the Rebbe made the army of Hashem, he called it an army. And he got a lot of criticism. This is the early 80s, you know. For those of us who are young enough, you remember what they called the industrial military complex, where people were making billions and billions of dollars building weapons of destruction and selling them to the third world, all in the name of the Cold War. And there was this whole very, very negative attitude. It, it exists in many places still, but then it was really, it was a big deal. There were protests. And here the Lubavitcher had been made an organization for children, and he called it the army, the army of Hashem. So a psychotherapist, who was also an educator, wrote the Rebbe a letter, and said, I think you made a mistake. You're, you're encouraging violence. You're encouraging children to think of themselves as members of a group who are defined by physical violence. And it's a bad, it's a bad message. It's a bad uh, image. So the Rebbe wrote a four-page letter, which is published. And if you want to find a letter, you can visit Inside Hasidus, I have to self-promote at least once in the middle of my talk. If I have a Rebbe page, if you can find it, there's a lot of stuff on my side. I have a very, very long Rebbe page. The biography of the, the Rebbe page, every single class comes along in a PDF. So you don't have to listen to me, you can just take the PDF. So I have a class on Sivis Hashem. If you'll find it, you can click it and you'll open it up and you'll, the letter is there, the whole letter. The Rebbe wrote this doctor a long letter explaining, defending his position. Amongst the things he says is, I was very careful to take out all the imagery that had to do with weapons and violence. But the Rebbe concludes by saying, why did I choose the word army? And the Rebbe says something very upsetting. And he, this, is, oh, this is 40 years ago. Last year was the 40th anniversary of the founding of Tivus Hashem. And now it's so much more serious. It's so much more severe what the Rebbe spoke to. So much more of a problem. The Rebbe said, I'm, I'm living in America. And I'm watching American children grow up. And they have no sense of responsibility. They have no sense of discipline. They have no sense of respect for elders. They're just afraid of the policemen. They're only not going to commit a crime because they want to be arrested. And today they're not even afraid of the policemen because the judges are so liberal. They're going to let them off anyway. And the Rebbe says, I'm watching the civilization which I live fall apart. It's corroding under a lack of values. Under a lack of values. Kids are growing up and do whatever they want. And there's no sense of shame. There's no sense of responsibility. There's no sense of righteousness. There's just a sense of what can I get away with. And then the Rebbe writes these words. I thought about it long and hard. I thought about it long and hard. And I decided, says the Rebbe, that American youth, if America is going to survive as a civilization, the children and clock, all of us, have to learn Kabbalah Sail. Kabbalah Sail means when somebody tells you to do something, the answer is not why. It's okay. When your father or your mother tells a little child, and when your rabbi tells you as a member of your congregation, or whatever it is, I don't want to start any trouble over here, but your authority tells you, you'll say, why? You do it. You can ask why later. You'll have to understand. But you have to, you have to listen. Children have to know that when they're given an instruction by the parents or by their teachers, they have to listen. They have to learn that they don't only do what they feel like. They don't only do what they agree with. They live in a world and in the world there's a correct mode of behavior which is based on principles of righteousness and they need to follow them when they're not in the mood they have to do them or not do them as it were so the Rebbe says I was looking where in America is there any discipline left where in America is there any subgroup within our civilization where there's still a sense of order where there's still a sense of respect and the only place I found it was in the military the only place in this country when you get an order you say yes sir instead of who are you to tell me what to do. So I said I had no choice. I had to use a military model because I created this organization to teach the children not to be Jewish, but to be Jewish because their adult par their parents told them, their teachers told them. That's enough of a reason. Every human being needs to be able to accept. We don't only do what we, we agree with and we understand what we feel. It's the basis of every civilization. And this is Rabbi Yisai, Rabbi Yisai, Rabbi Yisai. This is a serious part of Chinuch. Right? I'm, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm not over the hill yet. My youngest is 14, so they can still ruin my life, Baruch Hashem. But some of you are younger than I am, and you're in the throes of Chinuch. It's, to call it a full-time job is an understatement. And they, there's so many things going on, huh? But you have to raise them. And you have to teach them. And you don't force them. You don't force them. 
But there is this idea, Amadah Fogan, there is this idea that you're supposed to do what you're told because it was told to you by an adult. That's Tchinuch. It's not un American. It's not taking away their freedom. It's teaching them to be mentioned. And this is a, 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 at the heart of the Rebbe's philosophy of Chinuch is this idea. And I want you to know that when the Rebbe made the campaign for Goyim, the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noyach, he said the same thing. Goyim keep the Sheva Mitzvah not because they are meaningful, because they like them, but because there's an eye that sees and an ear that hears and everything that they do is recorded in a book. A guy can love God. He really can. He can have a very meaningful relationship with God. But his life is defined by following the rules that the Abish has set because the Abish is going to judge him. That's very un-American. It's very un-free uh, and liberal and happy and I can do whatever I want. The Rebbe says we have to teach our children and ourselves this value. And it's not an easy thing to teach because the world... It's pushing back against it to such a tragic degree. But we, we need to do everything in our power. To, we don't have to control our children. You don't, when you teach, when you force children to do things, you haven't taught them anything. But you teach them that they have to do what they were told. You teach them that they have to do what they were told. It's an incredibly important lesson. It's a good lesson to learn. It's a good lesson to learn because as adults, you find out that you better listen or you get fired, you understand. And over here you can't say, what about the liberal in America? That's not, not the way it works. It works in school, it works in the playground, it works in the home, it doesn't work in life. And we, this is part of Chinuch, it's a very important part of Chinuch. We raise our children, we give them Jewish values, and we teach them that they need to listen. That they need to listen. Now, I, I want to tell you a story. I meant to tell this to you before and I couldn't find it on my notes, so I'll tell it to you now. I was 22 years old, 21, 22 years old. And I was put on a list to go speak in a shul on Yom Tov. You know, we do ta'alucha, you go to different communities. I was put on a list. I was a 21 schnekel. I wasn't nobody. But uh, <laughs> I was a good speaker in cleaning guard. No one asked. So they put me on a list. And I was so afraid. I had no idea who shul I was going into, what kind of community I was going to read. So I needed more support. So I took a look at my father. So my father was in the audience and I was the speaker, you understand? When I walked into the shul, of course, everybody rose my father and told him, reason. no, 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 <laughs> he's the speaker. I'm just, I'm just making sure he keeps his chin up. Anyway, I've had this experience twice in my life. I walked into a shul, and I, and I, I mean this very genuinely, and I saw a holy man, a holy, really, a holy, I had twice that experience, once in Manhattan, and both of them were Horowitz. You looked at this Jew, when I, this story happened probably in 1987, about 35 years ago. He was probably in his 70s, he was a Holocaust survivor. He grew up before the war, he went to the best yeshivas, he was a very, very big Talmud Chacham. I, I asked people about him. He didn't wear Shneimel. After the Holocaust, he said, I'm not putting on a fur hat. He wore, he was a, it was a rod, he was considered like a Rebbe, you know, he came from holy ancestry, he just wore a, a, a Humburg, a hat. He wouldn't put on a Shneimel. And you looked at him, you saw that this was a beautiful Jew, a real, genuine Jew. Wise, knowledgeable, kind, humble. And I got up to speak all my 22 years. And he went away from the front of the shul, sat down in the first row to listen to me talk. Which was very unnerving. It, was, it, was, it made me feel very good, but it was also, I mean, I, I, you took one look at this person, you saw, you know, if all of us looked like that, it would be a different world. It was really beautiful. And I, I had this experience twice. And you sat and listened to my talk. You know how it is, you go into a show, half the people run out, the other half the people can't decide if they want to listen, so they listen and they don't listen, and then they come and they argue with you. But he sat and listened to my speech, right? Anyway, I finished my talk, we David Maidiv, and of course, as good Lubavitchers, we got up to dance. And this Yom Tiv is dancing. So this old rabbi got up to dance with us. You know, he may have been 80. He wasn't so young. He got up to dance with us. It was so beautiful. It was so real. I, 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 I related to that, you know, I, that's how it's supposed to be. You dance and dance, remember, day. I had a Rosh Yeshiva, who's now deceased, his name was Rabbi Friedman, Rabbi Saul Friedman, was a very big Talmud Chacham, a very big God. So he told me they had a Yeshiva in Etisro for a certain period of time. We had no teachers, they had no teachers, they were all by themselves, like six or eight boys, but the boys were brilliant, and they would learn a whole day, and they would waste their time all night, they had a lot of energy. They were good kids, but they were kids, and they, you know, they learned, and they davened, and they made trouble. In the shul where they were, there was an old Bayana Chassid, an old Chassid, a Bayan, Bayana Zeruzhin. The story happened 70 years ago. 
<laughs> you understand? The story happened a long time ago. There were kids, teenagers, and this by Yana Chassid sat in this show, and his Amidam commanded it. They weren't on their best behavior. They would make noise, they would throw things and get into fights, but they would learn. They were good boys. They learned and they died, but they also were kids. And he said, that old man never said a word to us. Never. We could do the craziest things. Never said a word. Sat in this corner. He says, whenever we danced, and we danced a lot, he says, whenever we danced, it didn't matter what he was doing, he would get up and dance with us. We fin- he lived in Shul, Pashat. We finished davening, went back to his corner. That's a chassat, you know. So this old man got up to dance with us. And there were a, sub- a couple of the boys, a couple of the chavir went along to the Shul, were uncomfortable. Listen, Lubavitchers are people too. And they were shy, and they were standing in the back. And we were dancing, and this rabbi is dancing with us. And each time we make a revolution, he turns to the two Lubavitchers and beckons them to join. He should come and dance. And they didn't want, they were 16, they were 15, whatever, they were self-conscious. So at some point he just stops. He plants his feet and he puts his head like this. He was very upset. Ich verstein nicht. Ihr sind doch Lubavitch. I don't understand. You're Lubavitch. You're Lubavitch. Now, of course, he was saying Lubavitchers dance. But how did I hear it? This was a Jew who saw golden, he saw real chassidus in the old country. He saw what it means Yidin could be great Talmud Chochem, very intelligent, very sophisticated people, and they were chassidim. And the chassidus showed itself amongst other things in joy. And he says, you're Lubavitch. You're Lubavitch, Lubavitch, Lubavitch has to sing and dance. Lubavitch is not allowed to be ashamed to be different. Lubavitch is not allowed to be ashamed to hide who they are, that they believe in Hashem and they serve Hashem with joy and all the other things. And he was so bothered by the fact that Lubavitchers had a difficulty being Lubavitch. And I, I'm just going to finish, okay? I'm going to stop my talk. Oh, I wait. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to do this. won't take too long, okay? I just want to say this because I find that often that people don't know. And then when I say it, your husbands are going to tell you, I know what I'm talking about, and then we'll have World War III, and it'll be a wonderful, useful talk. <laughs> I just want to tell you something very technical that m- people sometimes do not know. I mentioned to you before that it's perfectly legitimate to go to the oil and not do anything, just to stand there or say, till I'm not to write any notes, just be there. But we do write notes. And I just want to clarify that the notes that we write by the Oihel go basically into two groups, maybe three, but two groups, okay? We write what's called a pan, a pidyan nefesh, and we write what's called a letter, or as some of you would call it, a duch. And they're very different kinds of notes, and they're designed to be different things. And I want to clarify this, because a lot of people are confused about it, okay? In a pan, in a pidyan nefesh, the only thing that really matters is your name and your mother's name. But please get it right. Don't skip one of the names. You know, the Rebbe once said to a lady, you're missing one of your kids. <laughs> the Rebbe remembered that she forgot. <laughs> um, you have to say the name exactly. Because a pan is a neshama document. That's the concept. The pidyan nefesh is a soul document. You're coming to a soul Jew, a yid who's really connected to the neshama, and saying, here's my soul. I don't know anything about my soul. You know far more about it. Do something with it. And the soul is represented by our Hebrew name. And you've all heard the stories about people who had the names wrong, and the Rebbe would say, I don't know such a person, and so on. I heard a story. I heard a story that's crazy. There's a rabbi that I know. He's probably 75. He got married early 1970s. Grew up in Boston. His mother was at Sadekis. His mother got sick. She died very young. And he went into the Rebbe every year on his birthday and asked for the four shlemah for his mother. And each time they never said, is this your mother's name? He, he knew his mother's name. Whatever his mother's name, is your mother's name? And he would say, yeah. He told me, probably two years ago, that he went to Florida and he met an old aunt and she told him that his mother had another name. Imagine. Every time they never said, this is your mother's name, you sure? He said, yeah. And he was missing a name. He Pasha didn't know. It's so upsetting. It's so, it's incredible. But uh, that's what a pan is. The most important thing is a pan is the name and the mother's name because it's a neshama document. The tradition is that you write on top pei nun. You don't write by the samachdalat. Pei nun, which means pidyan nefesh. I can write it down for you if you have a difficulty. The Rebbe used to write alai, not avudi. I know a lot of people write avudi. And then and that's it. Write your mother, your name and your mother's name. People put requests in a pan. But appreciate when you put it. You're not asking in the pan to get a red car or a 
pink car, whatever your fancy is. In the Pedian Nefesh, you could the kind of things like health, like Hiskashrus, like Nachas, things that touch your soul, you put in a pan. It's a very precise document, which is really, like I said, the most important thing is you know, your mother's name. And I got a story for you which will blow your minds completely. I have a former student who told me the story herself. That she went to college in some campus. And on that campus, there was no Chabad house yet. There was no Hillel. Because it was too liberal a campus. They had a bayit. A bayit meant basically it was a co-ed house for Jews. And there was absolutely nothing Jewish about it except that it was called bayit. And she hung around in this bayit. And the shliach would come every Friday and beg the kids to come for Friday night dinner. And they weren't interested. College students love to come Friday dinner because it's a home-cooked meal. I mean, they're all eating, uh, what do they call it? Uh, but it's not it's, 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 eat a home cooked meal is a very beautiful thing and they were so not interested she says years and years later I did a, a calculation every single boy and girl that used to frequent that bite in the year I was there is from every single one is from they're not all Lubavitch but they're all from the likelihood of that happening is like a likelihood of me having hair on my palm so she called up the shliach and she said did you write our names into the river <laughs> And he says, it's the first thing I do. As soon as the new crop of students come in, I go take their names and send them to the Rebbe. Every single one was from. That's a crazy story. So that's a pun. So if you write somebody else's name and you pidgin nefesh, you may ruin their life also in addition to ruining your own life. <laughs> now when you write a letter, a letter is a, a human letter. You're writing to the Rebbe as a person and you're a person. So you address the Rebbe how you feel comfortable and you write the way you're comfortable. I have learned over my life that you should really tell the Rebbe everything. When I, I mean, I, I, I've been going to the oil a lot, but when I go, you know, my regular visits, I write, really, I read a phone book. I just write everything. I want the Rebbe to know everything going on in my life. I think it's important that the Rebbe should know what's going on in your life. And I also think it's important that you should keep copies of these letters because they're the most honest account of your life. If you keep copies of your letters, you look back at them later, you'll remember all the important things that's happened. Well, just a practical suggestion. And in a letter, you write what's on your mind what's going on with your husband, with yourself, with the children, with the children-in-law, with the grandchildren, with the work, with everything, with the community. And of course, you, pl you, you, you spend time. You don't just write in circles. You organize your thoughts and you write point A, point B, point C. And when you sign it at the end, you write your family name. You don't just write your name and your mother's name. You'll write Yosef Yitzchok Ben Rachel, Paul Thiel, my wife and I. We, this is what we do. We write letters together, so I'll write both names and we'll sign our name, Paul Thiel. Um, and this document is a reflection of, of, of how you know yourself, as opposed to the pan. And this is also a duch. When you give the Rebbe a din v'chesh, when the Rebbe an accounting of what's going on in your public activities and your personal activities, you write to the Rebbe the way you see it, and the way you understand it, and the way you're comfortable writing it. And I just want to say that Hashem should give all of us a lot of simcha and a lot of health. And it should be easy. He yeah, could if he wants. But we should figure out how to live with the Rebbe with Amuna and with Simcha and with Maise and with Chinuch that's plenty I promise you it's plenty it's more than enough it's so much guilt oh my god I can't handle it one of these is enough ha huh? and Hashem should give us a schuz we should push it to have shalom bias with our we should get along what is the old expression I should just love him I should actually like him oh what a crazy idea oh, huh? <laughs> um, and we should get along with our children and we should raise them and we, it's not going to be easy nothing is easy it should be successful and it should be blessed and it should be fruitful and it should be peaceful and it should be happy and it should be Yiddish and it should be Yiddish um, and we should be it's a Gewaldek it's such a wonderful story there was a Yid who was very poor and he had a lot of expenses and he had a lot of children and nobody wanted to marry his kids because nobody to make a wedding and um, life was hard and of course, there was a lot of stress in his home because he wasn't able to make ends meet and he couldn't support his family. And his wife said to him, listen, you have an uncle who lives in Vienna. His uncle lives in Vienna was very, very rich. He had no children, he had no wife, he had all this money, nothing to do with it. And he wasn't religious. He said, go to your uncle. This goes back 180 years, 200 years. Go, go to your uncle and uh, ask him for some money. He has no need for the money. And he, a little bit of money for him is, in, is for you a wealth. He says, he's going to make fun of me. He's going to call me a loser. He's going to say, I still believe in those ancient superstitions and every once in a while when it really became difficult they'd have this whole argument until finally one day he says you know what I'm going to go I'm going to Vienna I'm going to my uncle 
Oh, the house was so happy. They got him a release and they got him a coat and they got him a ticket and the whole thing. And he's about to leave the house to go to the train to go to see his uncle and he says, you know what? I'm not going. <laughs> I changed my mind. And don't ask what happened. He says, what do you mean you're not going? You, we've, we've spent all this money on all of these accommodations. And so he said in Yiddish, Ver zokt azer lept. Und azer lept, ver zokt azer hod gelt. Und azer hod gelt, ver zokt azer vil gelt. Aber der Rebisch dann lebt. Und er hat Geld. Und er will geben. Which means, who says he's still alive? Maybe, maybe he died. And if he's still alive, maybe he lost all of his money. Maybe he went broke. And if he has money, maybe he doesn't want to give it to me. But God is alive. He's got plenty of money. And he wants to give it. This was his explanation. So, him and his wife didn't talk to each other for a week. Um... A little while after a man and knocks on the door, he was a sergeant or an officer in the, in the Russian army, and he says, listen, I'm going to the front. There's nobody in the world I can trust. Here's all my wealth. It was a lot of money. If I'm not back in three months, it means I'm dead. It's yours. But if I return, you can give it back to me. Because he knew that this Jew was going to give it back to him to the penny. He trusted him. He says, listen, I can't trust anybody else. I'm leaving you. If I don't come back in 90 days, it means I'm dead. It's yours. There's nobody else. No one is going to come and collect it. They don't even know I have it. Anyway, the 90 days turns into 60 to 280 days and 270 days. And his wife says, take the money. He said, if he doesn't come back in 90 days, he's dead. He says, how can I touch it? What if he comes back tomorrow? And then another thing to fight about. <laughs> so finally, when that one of these big arguments, you know what? I'm going to the Rebbe, to the Hillel of Ruzhin. Holy Rebbe, the of Ruzhin, the great Rebbe, Ruzhin the Rebbe. So he gets on a train and he travels to Ruzhin, he comes to the Ruzhin Rebbe, he steps across the threshold of his door and the Ruzhin's face is beaming. And before he could say a word, the Ruzhin says, Der Ebisch der lebt, und er hat Geld, und er hat gegeben. God Almighty is alive and he has money and he gave some to you. Der Ebisch der lebt, und er hat Geld, und er hat gegeben. Hashem should give us Panasen and health and Nachas and Shalom Bayes. He has it. So they gave him the pile mamish. Let him make it easy for all of us. Okay, that's the st- I needed to tell that story. Okay. So should we should all experience that story. We should experience that story in our lives, in the lives of our children, and of all of our friends.